Um, last night, I congratulated Donald Trump and offered to work with him on behalf of our country. I hope that he will be a successful president for all Americans. This is not the outcome we wanted or we worked so hard for. And I'm sorry that we did not win this election for the values we share and the vision we hold for our country. I'm Sarah Guillermo, and today I'm the face of America. I'm Nye Whitaker, and today I'm the face of America. I'm Kimberly Peeler Allen, and today I'm the face of America. I'm Wartha Khalid, and today I'm the face of America. Hi, I'm Monifa Bandele, and today I am the face of America. I ran for my first election when I was in the first grade, having moved to America um, when I was two years old. Um, and it was really evident to me that I, as I sat around my first grade classroom to be the classroom organizer, <laughs> um, that there were kids around that table that were not girls and that weren't people of color. And at, funny enough, six years old, it you know kept going with me. Um, so I continued to run for office. Um, I served in numerous different leadership roles um, across my education. I currently serve on a community board um, in the county that I live in um, on health commission. And it's been just a really huge part of me. When we can get young people to the table and have their ideas at the table, making the decisions and making the policies that we have, will be more of a strengths-based community and we won't be constantly thinking about risk factors and how to do preventative, you know, different pieces and not always being reactionary because we have all different perspectives at the table. Um, and I think it's such a privilege to be able to work with Ignite in this particular role because I'm able to create a space for young people across the country, no matter where they come from, no matter what their viewpoints are, and to give them support, a community, to them and be able to take their ambition and run with it. The United Poland Movement dates from 1848, when a convention to consider the rights of women was held in Seneca Falls, New York. The committee drafting the list of women's wrongs found her grievances against the government of men. Everyone believed that Hillary Clinton would become the next president of the United States of America. I actually worked on the Harlem for Hillary campaign after having worked on both of the election campaigns for President Obama. My name is Nye Whitaker and I'm the founding executive director of Emerge New York. We recruit, train and mentor democratic women from diverse backgrounds to run for office and win. I actually ran for office three times. I'm born and raised um, on the Upper East Side in East Harlem. The last time that I ran, I lost by nine votes. So what I would say to people who don't vote is that every vote counts. I also would say to people that they forget we benefit from living in a very progressive democratic city of New York, which yes, is considered blue, very democratic, very liberal. But I represent the state of New York, all 62 counties. And as a state, New York is actually purple. What that means is that though the city and some of our kind of more urban communities are very democratic, once you get out to Staten Island, Long Island, you go to what we call North Country in upstate, and there are very, very deep pockets of red. And so I think it's important for us to realize, again, that it's not always important about what's happening in my one community. For example, uh, Brooklyn is very active. We have so many new groups that are coming out um, of Brooklyn in terms of Indivisibles and Rep Your Block and Get Organized Brooklyn and on and on. But I've lived in Harlem for over 40 years, and it's a center of civil rights, but yet we're losing some of our activism and we're losing some of our elected officials. And with redistricting, we stand to lose if people don't come out and vote in this particular cycle of 2018, a whole block of our democratic um, uh, areas in the 2020 redistricting uh, due to the census. In New York, Governor and Mrs. Dewey vote early as usual. In 48, they had to wait all night for the results. But this year, they know the answer within two hours at headquarters. The governor wins a third term with a smashing half-million margin. 
Um, my name is Kimberly Peeler Allen, and I am co founder of Higher Heights, which is a national organization focused on harnessing the political power of black women from the voting booth to elected office. The number of white male elected officials, it's almost uh, like 85% of the of elected leaders in this country across um, all of, at all levels of government are white and male. And people are saying that's not what America looks like anymore. We're not having uh, our voices, the diverse life experience of what it is to be an American um, is really rep being represented by you know, this population that has kind of a monolithic um, uh, demographic to it. So how can we diversify the decision-making tables? And I think many elected officials are really seeing that and you're seeing some who are making concerted efforts to diversify their staff or make sure that they are doing proper outreach to all of their communities. And then there's also uh, you know, the insurgence of candidates, women of color, people of color running against uh, so many of uh, these white male candidates or, or elected officials to try and diversify the pool and just make sure that more voices are heard, uh, you know, in the de democratic process. It has been contended that I should run because I have more national experience, office experience, than any of the other announced candidate. My name is Wartha Khalid. I'm a policy analyst, I'm a public speaker, and I'm an activist. I focus on Middle East policy, refugees, and Islam in America. I started an organization called Polygon Education Fund to teach Muslims how to engage with Congress, um, and I work on refugee and immigration advocacy full-time. When there is anti-Sharia legislation going on, why are we only showing up the day before, you know, and hoping that somebody will listen to us instead of being there every single day, 365 days of a year, telling our members of Congress and our state representatives and our local representatives how we feel about issues and that we do have power and that we are going to vote. And if they don't do the right thing, we will vote them out. So this is what I'm trying to do is like help Muslim Americans get plugged into the policy making process. And that's exactly what Polygon is about. I'm Monifa Bandele, I'm a senior vice president at Moms Rising, and we are a national public policy organization fighting for the rights and health and well-being of women and mothers all across the nation. One of the main reasons that we mobilized women and mothers to the polls was to put in place people who will stop the Trump administration. Right now, Congress is all that stands between you know, the Trump administration and the people. And so we had to make sure that we had people in those seats that represent our communities. And immigration is one of those key issues that we're hoping that the new Congress can find solutions to make sure that people who are, who, who are protected, who are coming seeking asylum, people who are currently in the country on TPS are supported and protected, and of course to find a permanent solution for people who are a part of the DACA program. So we knew we had to take out some of the Trump followers that were in Congress, and not only do we have a great number of women in Congress, but many of them have taken over the seats of people in Congress who were supporting Trump's horrible policies on immigration. One of the questions I ask all of our young people as they come into the doors is, what do you want to change in your community? Um, and as we start to unravel what those different pieces are, people are telling me, I want to get the stop sign down the street so that you know people are not getting hit every day. I want to make sure that there's no gun violence so that my next, my cousin or my brother or X, Y, or Z doesn't die next. And what the root causes are of those that we unravel is that it's all related to policy. And what we figure out with our young people is that all of these pieces are related to policy and who is making those decisions. People that don't necessarily look like me, like you, like all of us. And so they start to figure out that all of these different pieces are interconnected and that all of the issues that they are experiencing, that their families are experiencing, are related to policies that po politicians and political leaders in their communities or in Washington, D.C. are making for them. Well, we are really lucky. We have a champion that won a seat in Congress. She took over the seat of Newt Gingrich and her name is Lucy McBath. And she is in Congress and one of her sole purposes is to change the gun laws in the United States. Her son was killed by a white supremacist 
who had guns and was able to shoot at him and his friends in their car because they were playing music. And she's led a campaign mobilizing other mothers, mobilizing policymakers, and mobilizing people to the polls to not only flip the district that she ran in, but to also support her in her agenda to reform um, United States gun laws. So we're hoping to line up behind Lucy McBath, have her back, have her sides, have her front, and push common sense gun laws in the United States. It's beyond time. And we know that it's probably gonna take a woman and a mom like Lucy to do it. When I was um, about 16, I had the opportunity to intern on Capitol Hill for Congresswoman Pat Schroeder of Colorado. And that was uh, during the time of the tailhook scandal where um, almost 100 um, women were assaulted by um, some naval officers during a convention in Las Vegas. And uh, Congresswoman Schroeder was the chair of the Armed Services Committee, so she called a hearing, and uh, or she was part of the hearing. And during the questioning, she was uh, one of the most um, aggressive questioners of uh, members of the Defense Department and the officers in the uh, Marine Corps and the Navy uh, about what happened there, and made sure that those victims uh, received some sort of justice. And it was my job in the week that I worked with her to actually open the mail. So I saw uh, just um, all sorts of uh, letters and faxes, uh, many in support and many more, um, you know, basically threats against her uh, for her activism to support these victims. And it was at that point in time that I realized how much uh, politics and government um, was important to our day-to-day -day lives um, and then also more importantly the the fact that there were so few women in Congress at the time this was the early 90s uh, that their voice needed to be there because no one else was uh, as aggressive in the questioning um, and uh, the demands for answers uh, as Congresswoman Schroeder was and I think that was um, you know a big part of that was because she was a woman. So it was my, um, you know, I, it, I started down this road of saying, okay, how can I become more involved in politics? And the more I got involved, the more I saw uh, how imbalanced um, the participants were and that there were so few black women who were at the decision-making tables and then those who were at the tables were often marginalized. So after um, many years of working in New York politics, my good friend Glenda Carr and I decided that we just had enough and we needed to create an organization that was going to really focus on black women and bring them to the table because they had so much to offer and there were so many black women across the country who were looking for an entry point uh, of a way to raise their voice and make sure that their leadership mattered in this country and Higher Heights was born. Voter suppression is rampant. Um, we had a major get out the vote campaign in the state of Georgia where women and moms turned out in record numbers and yet I think the numbers right now are about 300,000 votes were suppressed in a race that was really tight, that was only called with about a 20,000 uh, vote margin. Provisional ballots weren't counted, poll, polling sites were closed, and people were illegally purged from the voting rolls um, through claims that they had moved out of the state when they hadn't. And so, you know, this is very disheartening, but we continue to fight. We know it's very important for each and every person to vote in every election. And I think we're turning the tide. This midterm election, almost half of the people who can vote, of the electorate voted. And that's just record breaking. We usually have somewhere around 25%. And um, whenever I talk to people from other places, they're also shocked by our low voter turnout. But we're working on it every day. Many people have faced discrimination. Um, either they faced it personally or their parents. And so there becomes a culture within the community or within the home that it, it doesn't pay to vote or that they'll be unable to vote. So we've really got to go door by door. Another thing that's important to point out is that many states in the United States have what we call felony disenfranchisement laws, which means that people who have former convictions are also banned from voting. In a place like Florida, it met one and a half million people 
couldn't vote, were banned from voting for life because they had a former uh, felony conviction. And so those laws are being turned around now state by state. In fact, Florida, there was an amendment for on the ballot that won that will give an opportunity for those 1.4 million people to register to vote. But these are some of the many ways that people are banned from voting. And every time you ban and prevent someone from voting, there's a collateral consequence that their neighbors and their children and other men members of their family also will not vote. It's never just that one person. It almost creates a culture of fear and a feeling of marginalization that really permeates throughout that person's circle. So we're fighting, chipping away at the many ways that votes are suppressed, knowing that that will increase turnout even amongst people who aren't technically suppressed. I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. I am not the candidate of black America, although I am black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman, and I'm equally proud of that. I think the Muslim ban is very, um, it's, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to put into words how bad the Muslim ban is. It's, it's disappointing. It is infuriating. It is condescending. It's just, uh, you know, the worst, po worst possible things about America that could happen is, is in this Muslim ban. You know, the way, um, you know, we're discriminating against a f group of people simply because of the way that they pray or what they believe in. Um, and it's rooted in this deep Islamophobia and white supremacy of the current administration. And, you know, they've made no, um, they, you know, they've made no excuses for it. Like even on President Trump when he was campaigning, you know, he was constantly saying things like, you know, total and complete shutdown for, from Muslims entered in the United States to Islam hates us. Um, to not really directly refuting questions about registering Muslims or putting them in camps or anything like that. So, um, you know, he could have taken a stand against this, but he's enabling people to pass this. And he tried three different times to pass a Muslim ban, and now he finally succeeded at the Supreme Court last week. And uh, that was really disheartening for our community. Um, but it also kind of shows, puts the cards on the table and shows us what we're up against um, and motivates people to work even harder to overcome this and you know, go back to what America's values truly are and truly should be instead of where we're at right now. I believe that when people talk about the women's empowerment movement, we're probably misusing the word. Women have always had power. It's a matter of them owning that power and exercising it. And that's what we're here to teach women to do. You know, when you're trying to diversify uh, power structures, uh, you know, there's going to be uh, efforts to hold that back and the biggest way to do that and, and the easiest way to do that in many of these jurisdictions is through voter suppression and changing voting rules and we're seeing uh, rules and laws being passed or being uh, put on the ballot as ballot initiatives all across the country. There's one in North Carolina that is extremely disturbing around um, the uh, need for proper um, a very lim a very narrow definition of proper uh, uh, identification to be able to vote uh, that is anticipated to disenfranchise hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians. Uh, we saw in 2016, uh, I think it was Michigan that changed their laws uh, right before the election to the point where people were showing up at the polls and not even aware that the laws had changed and they didn't, they no longer had valid ID. Uh, and all of these things are you know, this is why it's important to vote in each and every election because so many of these laws come from the state legislatures and being able to make sure that you have uh, legislators who are making sure that they are making sure that people have the ability to vote is um, is critically important instead of making it uh, harder to vote or you know trying to root out uh, voter fraud which has been uh, proven in just uh, just a handful of cases across the country uh, instead of the, um, the wide conspiracy that that many would like to espouse uh, by making sure that it is actually easier and um, 
there's a there's more uh, openness and outreach to voters to make sure they know when to vote, where to vote, and uh, you know, like extending uh, early voting two weeks before. That's something that we would love to have here in New York uh, instead of sing one day voting, just to make sure that more people are able to participate. Because voting on a at, you know, random Tuesday, whether it is in the spring or in November, is not something that is um, you know, in our normal activity. So you have to really divert your life uh, to make sure that you get to the polls on time and there to be able to cast your vote and, you know, finding ways to make that uh, less cumbersome uh, will definitely, I think, um, improve our democracy. When I was in fourth grade, uh, we learned about government and politics in my school in East Harlem and started our first student government. And I ran for office as student government in fourth grade. And my nickname was Whitaker White House because all I did was talk about politics and organizing. So for me, I feel like it's been with my blood. My mother has been a delegate with 1199 for over 40 years. My father worked in transit, his father before him, her mother before her. So I was used to kitchen table conversations where people were organizing around tenant issues, around childcare issues, um, going on buses to Albany. So I actually grew up thinking that that was the norm and that everybody else was doing the same. And it was only when I went to college, it was only as I started to see different issues come to the forefront that I realized not everybody talks about politics at their dining room tables, though they should. My name is Geraldine Ferraro. I stand before you to proclaim tonight, America is the land where dreams can come true for all of us. We're nonpartisan, actually. Um, at the end of the day, we want young women up and down the ballot across all of the aisles to be running for office. And we don't want it to be a conversation about the first um, ex-president or the first um, female senator in, se in X state. We want it to be all young women, no matter what your particular affiliation is. And we don't even ask <laughs> when they enter and we don't really truly want to know. So my work for the Muslim community actually stemmed from the rise of Islamophobia. Back in 2009, I started a blog for the Houston Chronicle called Young American Muslim. And the reason why I started that was this was the time when Obama had just gotten elected. We were seeing really anti-Muslim rhetoric everywhere because people were accusing him of being Muslim, you know, as if that's a bad thing. Um, and we, I saw a lot of misconceptions about Islam. Um, the Ground Zero Mosque controversy was going on. I saw people like Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer going around, you know, proclaiming lies about Islam and scaring people about it. And so for me, as a Muslim American, you know, from Texas, I felt like I was in a unique position to kind of bridge that gap between Muslims in the U.S. Um, and, you know, non-Muslims in the U.S. And so I started my blog working there just you know, because I felt like there needed to be some sense of justice, there needed to be some sense of civility, there needed to be some sense of actual accurate information about my faith. I'm doing this work because this is what I was raised to do. I come from a family of generations of activists. My grandparents were activists, my parents were social workers and activists, and they basically raised us to make sure that whatever work we did, it didn't just benefit ourselves, that it benefit the community, and that we also raise our children to be socially conscious and to make sure that their work reaches beyond their own homes. Um, like I said, both my parents were social workers and community activists. My father was a, black, a member of the Black Panther Party here in New York City. And so we were raised with the understanding that we had to create the future that we wanted for ourselves and for our children. And so I carry that tradition, um, you know, personally. Uh, my husband's also an activist and works at a nonprofit, and our teenagers are very engaged in their schools. Um, and so, you know, we are definitely personally touched by some of the issues. Um, my maternal grandmother um, lost her life because of the segregated healthcare system in South Texas. And my mom actually, as a young person, watched her mother when she was dying be turned away from a hospital when she needed care. And so we do have very personal connections to these issues of um, health care, uh, voter suppression, mass incarceration, but we're also raised in a family 
where we were taught that it was our responsibility to change the outcomes that we were experiencing. And to the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, I extend to you this gavel. Thank you. We are actually a nonpartisan organization, uh, but we do have tenants that we look, uh, particularly when we're looking at endorsing candidates uh, through Higher Heights for America, we look at what our members have told us. We have members across the country who we survey on a very regular basis uh, so that we can be that authentic voice for black women, for and by black women. And they have really told us uh, time and time again over the years that they are concerned with making sure that we have um, economic security, pay equity, raising the minimum wage, um, access to high quality public education, expanding affordable health care, uh, many of the issues that fall into the progressive or uh, democratic uh, you know, uh, platforms. Uh, but if we come across black women who are running for office who agree with those uh, those tenants, uh, we are more than uh, excited to support them. We haven't come across any of them just yet, but I know that they are out there because they are part of our membership. We have members who are independent, who are Green Party, who are Republican who are conservative, but they all recognize the importance of making sure that their voices, uh, regardless of what their, um, what their party affiliation is, that their voices are part of the discourse. We work with young girls, and so we start at middle school and high school, um, and, as, and we're particularly strategic about those particular demographics because we want to work with young women as they're building their ambition and as they're forming their own identities. And so if you get to them younger and then they run through our programming, middle school, high school, through college, and then now we have an alumni network, then we're building it for not just like 30 seconds, we're building it across 10 years. And we're gonna get to our 10 year anniversary next year. Um, and so it's this longer process of being able to build that political ambition, and we're training them. We're working with them on public speaking, we're working with them on how to build their network, we're introducing them to elected officials, um, they're working on campaigns, they're getting out the vote. Our huge campaign this summer is around voter registration, and so we have thousands of young women that are stepping up. You'll see them at the farmer's market, at the concert festivals, um, engaging with our community members to not only register to vote, but to be really informed voters. For the first two to three months, I was miserable. The gentleman did not pay me any mind at all. When I would go to the lunchroom, to eat, they would not sit at the same table as I did because I was a black woman. Well, speaking on behalf of myself and not Moms Rising, I think that it is high time that we had a black woman in the White House. Um, I think there are enough candidates out there. There are people like Senator Kamala Harris. There are people like the candidate that run, ran for go governor of Georgia, Stacey Abrams, and many, many fighters in Congress um, who have always done a huge amount of work, um, typically are not allowed to be the face of the party, but always have been the backbone of the party, that now it's time for a black woman to be the face of the party. And I think it'd be wonderful in 2020 to have a leader like the, like the, one, like the person we've seen in Stacey Abrams, who's been um, very vigilant in the work that she's done in the state of Georgia. I think between now and 2020, she's gonna to work to change many of the laws that suppressed the votes uh, that helped to steal the governorship from her. So I think she'd be an excellent candidate. And she's also one of my schoolmates from Spelman College. <laughs>